What is up, everybody? It's Hosh Nasi. We're here again for the Ham Radio Crash Course. Getting you your technician class license. This is episode three. <clears throat> Wanted to go back a little bit. Want to talk about some of the core stuff about radio. We're going to talk about the radio theory, how radios kind of work. We're going to talk about electronics. And then we're just going to cover your questions as well as we go along. I don't know why my, my little uh, fun machine here is not in focus, but... This has nothing to do with radio. This is just uh, me fooling around with the intro, I guess. <laughs> Waving hi. Uh, Vinny Kresge, what's up? MacDaddy8913, what's going on? And I want to say I was talking to hey O or he you or hey you in the chat. I don't know how you prefer to be called. Uh, but wanted to mention that he said he's firm on his electronics. Sorry, today's going to be a lot of electronics talk. But at the same time, I feel for you saying that uh, you need to go work on your FCC regulations and rules. I want to say really briefly, when it comes to FCC regulations and rules, there's a, there's a, a key thing you can remember. They're almost all common sense. <laughs> a lot of the stuff is common sense type stuff that you should you should kind of just know. You shouldn't have like that much of a surprise when you hear it and you're like, okay, yeah, sure. Remember, the FCC governs the United States. They govern the protectorates of the United States, Puerto Rico, Guam, that kind of stuff. But outside of the United States, uh, then it's a little bit more open playing field, right? So FCC rules for our FCC license are going to be governed by the FCC. Hey, hey, oh, hey, you, cool. <laughs> yeah, so appreciate that. I only saw the one Y, so it's either he, yo, or uh, hey, oh. Those could be Japanese names or a Chinese name. Who knows? Anyway, all right, enough fun with the, uh, enough fun with my little device here. By the way, if you're interested in this, this is uh, Tonic by Teenage Engineering. It's like a pocket calculator, but it's actually like a little synth. It's a cool little synth. Uh, runs on two AAA batteries. Really cool devices and it's actually got two headphone jacks they make a whole series of these and and you can have a bunch of them and you can daisy chain them together and you can have like a little synth uh recording studio um with with something that fits in the palm of your hand it's only this big right so cool anyway that's not what we're here to talk about we're here to talk about we're here to talk about ham radio <clears throat> okay so um, what I wanted to do, and, and I'm really flying by the seat of my pants on this one, but um, I've got my iPad here, and before, suggestions on local clubs, Ontario, California. Well, Brad, um, I don't know about official ham radio clubs, but there is a prepper club. They're on Meetup, uh, the meetup.com website, if you check them out. They're actually pretty cool guys, and they've done ham radio a couple of times. Uh, they're going to be more towards the prepper side of things. Um, as I mentioned, you can go to the ARRL, and you can look up uh, their website for clubs in your local area. I'm lucky enough that uh, the place I work is a pretty large aerospace company that has roots in radio, and so there's actually a club that's been in... The company's been bought and sold and bought and sold and... Well, not bought and sold, but it, it's been combining forever that we still have the original moniker of the company back when it first started. So that's the club I'm in. Um, who? What did I do before that? Oh, before that, it was the last company I was in. I guess I've always been lucky that I was involved in aerospace companies where there's always some contingent of ham radio operators that kind of want to uh, to all get together. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna go through basically real intro, not intro. Uh, let me let me let me take a moment. Let me take a moment and talk to talk to you guys about something. Uh, the technician class license is the bottom the bottom of the line. It's not it's not bargain basement, it's not bottom of the barrel. I don't mean it that way. I mean it's a it's a smattering of information to, to just get you started. Just get you right on that on that baseline. The test is not hard, guys. It's not. Hey you was just telling me in the chat before we kick this off that um, he got an eighty seven percent with his practice test and he's gonna go in and uh, he's gonna take his test uh, February, I think. That's a long time to wait. If I was packing in 87%, I'd go in and get it immediately. But he said he also wants to study for the general, so okay, more, more power to you. Um, this test is not hard. I know I mention that every video. I'm going to keep mentioning it because it's not hard. It, it's really not. You, you can study, uh, like I said, by the, the Gordon West book 
or go download the apps or go do a whole smattering of things and you will you will definitely get your license. The apps make it incredibly easy to just study anytime you're there. That's part of the reason why I'm not going over so many of the questions because if this is if this is enticing you to get it, um, then just pull up the app. You know, when you're when you're on the toilet before you go to bed, when you're on your way to work, if you take the bus or you take the train, like I used to take, uh, wherever you find yourself that you have some time, just just pull the app out and start studying. So yes, I do have a beer. Who asked that? Um, tilapia stone said beer i have i have a beer and then i have an alcoholic beverage uh <clears throat> vinnie kresky i wish i could write in usa lol ours is way more intense grr write in usa i think he means english anyway i've got a buzz ball you guys ever seen these buzz balls before look at this thing buzz ball this is the uh tequila rita Tequila Rita Buzz Ball. This is a tequila and vo vodka and triple sec. 20% alcohol in this little hand grenade uh, bottle thing. So let's let's open this guy. These are really hit and miss. They've got like 10 or 20 different flavors or something like that. And boy, oh boy, some of them are really bad. Ah, this one splashed up and hit me on a cut on my finger. Ooh, burns. Woo. Ooh. Oh. Okay. That'll get you where you're going. Buzz balls. Uh, tequila Rita's not bad. Not bad. Oh, Vinny Cresci, you meant the test. Yes. 35 questions. It's 35 questions pulled from a sampling of 450-something uh, question pool. Right? I don't have a cheat sheet in front of me. I'm looking down like the book's going to just leap out and tell me what it is. Yes. 35 questions. Mm. Okay, so <clears throat> let's let me get this open here. So here's my, my nice little drawing I made. <clears throat> These are two what you'd call pretty, <clears throat> pretty substantial old school stations. Uh, they're copies of each other. They're what they call boat anchors. Boat anchors refer to... Uh, receivers and transmitters and back in the day people had receivers and transmitters they were two separate things and they ran on vacuum tubes they were pretty serious stuff and it was really easy not easy but it was uh they were a bit bigger all the wires were bigger a lot of the equipment was bigger and you were able to understand how radios work a lot better <clears throat> so let me let me just let me give you a bit of a, a high level a high level look at this what color should i use let's go with yellow nope nope no, no, no. I should be using the pen. Um, so down in the left here is your mic, right? And next to that is your key, and that could be your CW key. And what that's doing is it's it's registering the oscillation. There's a diaphragm and microphones that, that, mo that measure, that measure the oscillation of the diaphragm, and that changes the thickness of the uh, electrostatic or the electrolytic, a material between the microphone, the, the two sides, which cause the frequency, a modulation of, of current. And usually it's a DC current. Um, <clears throat> what that does is it goes into the radio and usually there's a DC, well, if we're, if we're talking old school radio, there's a transfer from the DC into the AC via a transformer, which is one of the electronic devices we'll talk about. Um, oh, hey you, this is about five hours long total, three part series. I needed a ham radio fix after your first show, so I listened to them in the background, not my video. Um, I For those that are in the live chat, you will see this. For those that are watching this uh, after the fact, sorry, that's probably not going to be there. YouTube is uh, kind of a thorn in my side when it comes to live. They, they don't... Um, they don't keep the comments that happen live, so they're kind of like lost forever. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, so the lower left is you're ent you're introducing some kind of modulation into the uh, frequency modulation into the into the radio, either voice or you pushing down on a key like a straight key or paddle keys or whatever. And then the the radio is basically turning that from DC into AC. In some cases, there are other radios, but I'm using fairly high level stuff. And then it's it's modulating that right. It's using transistors to to basically create and amplify this signal into uh, a higher power 
in the case of a base station, which is what we're looking at, this is a base station, this is something that you'd sit in front of, it'd be permanently located next to or by a permanently located antenna. Oh my god, somebody just gave me $20! Wow, that is awesome! Peak hole of pilot, thank you, buddy. You just paid for a couple of beers for the for the next show. I appreciate that. Thank you. So um, basically, a hundred watts is what a lot of these base stations do. A hundred watts to two hundred watts. So the amplification and modulation, it's turning this this diaphragm's vibration of microphone into uh, magnetic waves, magnetic radiation. And that's being pushed out in the antenna. And the antenna, now here's the important thing about the antenna, right? Oh, my screen just went to sleep. So the antennas are built at either one half or one quarter wavelength. So if we're, uh, if we're talking on 20 meters, that's a physical 20 meter wave size. Right, so one half of that, ten meters; one quarter of that, five meters. Right, so antennas are tuned physically to whatever uh, frequency you wanted to talk on, and that radio is uh, is a match to that antenna. So it pushes out at the right frequency. Right, when we talk frequencies, even down to even down to the frequencies of our handy talkies. Right. We're talking about the frequency that we're going to be sending out our, our radio, our RF waves. And our antennas are matched to that frequency. Some are, are matched very, very well with very low losses. And others, not so much. Again, going back to handy talkies, handy talkies have pretty usually poorly matched antennas, um, which I'm going to make a video on. Um, and boy, oh boy, did I not expect the difficulty and complication uh, in that. Uh, so I've made HF antennas. I've made dipoles, I've made verticals, I've made all kinds of stuff. And what we're looking at here in this picture is a, is a vertical antenna. So the radio is, is sending 100 watts uh, at, a, at a certain frequency to the antenna. The antenna, in what it's doing is it's, it's, it's causing vibrations, it's, it's uh, resonating on that frequency with that power. It's basically sending this power into the air in the form of RF. And the purple line, right, the purple line, this transmission line, those, that's the frequency of our RF going at the speed of light, basically, the speed of light. These are all questions that are going to come up in the, light, in the license test, by the way. Almost everything I've covered right now is a question, so FYI. Um, the, the RF moves at the speed of light, and it doesn't just move in one direction in the case of these uh, these two antennas, although there are directional antennas called Yaggies, which is also part of your test. Uh, these are verticals, so they're omnidirectional. I'm just using the uh, the purple wave to, to denote that they're talking to another station. What happens when... Uh-oh. what Robert Swap? Hey, I found you on YouTube. <laughs> just sent me a message. Um... So the, the receiving radio, which is listening on that frequency, for whatever reason, pre-coordinated or not, let me get some more of my buzz balls here. For, for whatever reason, uh, listening on that frequency, the uh, antenna is energized by the RF that it is resonant, re resonantly receiving on. Okay, The radio will then take in that energy, those RFs, those RFs and demodulate them, right? Now, th there's a lot more to this. I am I am going over it very, very simply. And there's lots of different ways it's done. There are software-defined radios that use completely different uh, hardware than our regular, our, um, like the in the case, tube-based uh, radios. Anyway, the um, radio then takes that, demodulates it, and spits it out onto a speaker or headphones, and what is that? That's a diaphragm, and it uses magnets to push the diaphragm away or pull it back into uh, the housing. And the subtle changes in the air is what creates the sound waves that is the replacement or, or duplication of the original recorded transmission, recorded in the sense of like immediate generation of RF waves and then sent at the speed of light. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Any questions? <laughs> That was a lot. Where is the chat? Did I lose the chat? What's going on here? Oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, uh, by the way, P. Cola Pilot, uh, the way that works is if you have a question, 
the the twenty dollar or anybody who any amount of money i think all the way down to like 50 cents or whatever your questions pop right up to the top and then they'll like stay so you could do like twenty dollars and or 50 cents or whatever and you can ask a question um so anyway uh vinny let me go back vinny kresky yeah so wow is that russia are you from russia did you say russia I missed it. Anyway, Vinny is saying that um, wherever he's from, which hopefully he comes back and corrects us, they have a 100-question test, and they get have to get 80% correct. Comparison to the United States, 75% uh, correct, 35 questions. Canada. Okay. Wow, Canada, really? Um, I don't know anything about Canadian licensing. I do know that in the States, which we've covered, there's technician, general, and extra. Um Technician, general, and extra. Technician is the lowest class of radio. It also gives you the least amount of access to different uh, different bands, and mostly in the area of 2 meter and 70 centimeter, which we've talked about, which is some more of the shorter distance communications. So keep that in mind. Um, what we're generally talking about, although this picture that you're looking at can apply to FM, uh, AM, single sideband, whatever, the distance is going to change because the bandwidth required for these different types of communications is going to be longer, right? So, um, in order, let me go. Let me go back here. I should have actually. Uh, I should have actually created uh, multiple. Now you guys get to see how I do some of my work here. <laughs> um, so, CW, right? has like the smallest bandwidth of, of space, right? And then there's uh, digital, right? Like PSK31 and RIDI, which is, think of modem tones, like when you have, uh, back in the day when you go on AOL, for all you kitties that remember AOL. Um, <clears throat> those tones are received by your um, by who's ever receiving your modem, whether it's a server or whatever, right? In this case of radio, same idea. You're creating these tones out of your radio, usually via a computer, sent out over your antenna, which is resonant on the frequency you're talking on, received by another antenna that is within your propagation space, the area at which that can be received, the area in which you are sending your RF out to, based off of your antenna, based off of the power of your transmissions, and based off of your radio. The radio then takes in that digital frequency, and it uh, boom, 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 demodulates it, sends it to the computer via sound card. And then your computer takes those tones and creates it into text or an image in some case, or even live video. So digital modes like uh, I'm playing with uh, FT8 right now, which is an extremely in-the-noise, uh, multi what do they call it, um, survivable, not survivable, survivable is the wrong word. Basically, it's a mode that even under very low power, you can get massive propagation and you can get like very long distances with very simple mode. It's mostly HF though, right? So this is kind of an incentive to get your general or think about getting your general. So hey, you, keep at it. Totally, uh, totally support that. Do all waves travel at the speed of light? Yes. Uh, all. Oh, actually, hey, you, did you say that? Yeah. So you, you answered. Yes, all radio uh, EMF waves propagate at the speed of light in any given medium, as far as I know, at Data Shark. So thank you for answering that. Basically, yes, I'm assuming that there's some kind of like minute modulations in there, or um, not modulations, minute differences, but it's probably not worth going into detail unless you're like going after and studying that. For your technician class license, it's not going to come up. Don't worry about it. What do we got? Uh, P. Cola Pilot. I had a CB with peaks and tweaks with single sideband as a kid. No idea what that meant. It was cool, though. Ah, all right. Well, single sideband is the next uh, wider bandwidth communication. So um, how single sideband works is there's two lobes. And this is going to look like a penis. Um, this is a carrier wave right in the middle in AM. And by the way, AM is the next, right? And that's bigger bandwidth. Um, well, single sideband, it just uses 
one of the side lobes, either the upper or lower sideband. I know that looks like a face now. Uh, but your carrier wave is in the middle, and then you have an upper and lower sideband. Well, somebody thought, well, how about we just get rid of the carrier in one of the upper or lower sidebands, and then we can just delineate whether which sideband we're going to use. And there's actually a way to determine um, which sideband you want to be on. Mainly people in uh, HF land are going to be more interested in this, but if you are in uh, something higher than 10 megahertz, you are on uh, upper sideband and bigger, sorry, smaller than that, bigger than that, smaller than that. I take that back. The way I normally use it, digital modes usually use upper sideband. Uh, when I'm on voice on 40, I'm usually on lower sideband. Don't worry, really. I don't know if that's actually a question on the test. It might be. Um, the, the idea that the sidebands exist and what they are is important. And that's, again, a normal carrier wave. You have a carrier wave in the middle and an upper lower sideband. Single sideband omits the carrier wave and one of the upper or lower sideband lobes and just leaves the, the single. Now, good thing about a uh, single sideband is that it is... Mm, it can it can go further mm, further than AM or FM right and and so AM is next AM requires a, a much bigger bandwidth and then there's FM FM requires a ton of bandwidth your uh, HT handy talkies are mainly FM there I don't uh, they they are some that support digital and digital modes are way more effective than FM um, with that said, what is that doing? Kind of what I said earlier. It's taking your voice, digitizing it, sending it out over, over through the radio, over the air, and whomever can receive it will then process that digital wave back into audio to be understood by the human. Okay, so that's bandwidth, right? So everything here is bandwidth. CW, very little bandwidth. Digital, bigger bandwidth. Then you get into voice. Voice, much bigger bandwidth almost double that, triple that in some cases, uh, just to go from digital to single sideband. And then AM gets bigger, and then FM is biggest of all. And then the biggest of biggest of all, which I'm not even going to put in here, which is basically the entire this entire space here in the middle, is uh, live TV, live video. You can do that with ham radio. It's like a ultra high speed, um, what do you call it? Ultra high speed television, scan television. There is a thing called slow scan television. Slow scan television is something we use on HF, and it basically, um, you can take a picture, you can put your call sign on it, and you can digitize it, and you can send that out um, all over the place. Okay. So where are we at? <clears throat> all right, so we talked about simple propagation, how radios work, and they all basically work on that principle. There are some var variations to that. But none that so important that are going to exist in your test. Not um, it's just the high level again. That's what we're covering here. So I found this cool website, uh, kb6nu.com, and it's the No Nonsense Technician License Course. And in particular, his section on uh, components within electric components within radios is very useful. And he breaks it up much like the test. Where is my... Here we go. Let me drag this over here so I can see. Uh, Vinny, hey, Ice Bomb, do you know what the pass grade is for just simple basic? All I can find is... Oh, so is that... Um, basic is the Canadian... The Canadian base level? Hmm. Good to know. If that's the case, tell me in the uh, in the chat. Mm. Wow, that buzz ball. I can already get it. I can already feel it. Uh, anyway, so very similar images. I think it's the same image. It's going to be in your test. And they put little numbers next to it. And the way that this does this, and, and I'll put this in the description for the video so you can check this out. Basically, it says component 3, T2. Component 4, T2. And it goes through the different components. So component 2 looks like a... a you ever get those rice crackers, you know, the little rice cylinder with the nori, with the seaweed? That's what those reminds me of. That's a fuse, a fused connection. Next to that, the two little dots with the, with the lever, that's a switch. That makes perfect sense. It's a switch. 
Number four. Number four is uh, is a transformer, right? And what's important to know about a transformer is a transformer is basically two coils that exist in a similar relative space. And what the what their job is to do is uh, one coil is charged with with some kind of frequency, either an oscillation or something like that, and that causes magnetic waves to radiate from the coil. The other coil's job is to pick up on those, um, those waves, those magnetic waves. And often what happens is the one picking up, in the case of a rectifier, uh, a DC current, which is just going to be a constant flow, right? The, and that's going to cause a magnetic field. The, the other side, which is going to pick up that magnetic wave is going to oscillate. It's going to go negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. What's that mean? Well, that's AC. That's how they convert things from DC to AC or vice versa. So um, that's how we do it. We use transformers to do it. In the case of uh, number four, there are um, two kinds of transformers that I believe are mentioned on the test. Uh, types that have a, a some kind of insulator in the middle or something that's defined as not air in the middle. And then there's an air gapped transformer. This would be the non air gapped. Okay. So passing grade for 99, I mentioned it earlier, maybe Mac you just came in 75% of the 35 questions, which I did very poorly last week on a practice test and still made, uh, made the 75%. So easy. I, I didn't study at all. So uh, number five on this list is a uh, diode. And there's a couple different types of diodes. If you look at five and then look at eight, what's the difference? You've got little like light or something shooting out of eight. Well, that's a light emitting diode, an LED. Six is a capacitor, right? And what's it say? It's a filter capacitor whose function is to help filter out 60 hertz components of the reflected AC. Capacitors um, collect and store, is that right? Collect and store and regulate power. Resistors actually step up the um, resistance in a circuit. And this is all to drive something. Uh, yeah, there you go, Sky, uh, Skyhauser. The, magne the magnetic field collapses, which causes this alternating current when it's picked up between the two coils. That level of detail, probably up to that point, is what's in the test, not much more. Okay, so what else we got? Ooh, there we go. So four is an antenna. Some of these things are going to be really easy to remember. An antenna always kind of looks like a speaker, and it's usually towards the top, towards the right-hand side of diagrams. That's not so. That's not always the case, but that's been my experience. <clears throat> um, circuit two, or I'm um, sorry, component two, is a capacitor. And then circuit, th what is circuit three? I don't even remember what circuit three is. Oh, variable inductor. A uh, variable inductor is that guy right there. Variable usually implies some level of control or modulation that you can do, whether that's uh, via a potentiometer or um, uh, pot cap. Um, you get the idea. I have a, another good reference. In fact, let me let me switch over again so I can show you. The um, Gordo book does a really really good job of this. Oh, here's my stylus. The Gordo book on page one sixty four has a really good um, diagram on all the devices, all the components you'll see on the test right there you go transformers right here transformers with core or an air core diodes right diodes you have led rectifier diode schlocky 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 is it schlocky sir variables fixed or regular or adjustable capacitors fixed or adjustable switches and then you get the good elmer elmer point that is in all the Gordo books. So um, <clears throat> I like these. Um, I, I know that some of them are better than others. Again, that's why I keep mentioning this book. 
you can go out and you can just get your, your license really easily by just downloading the app and through rote memorization um, learn the answers to the test and go take it. Now, I have a, I can make a really good argument why that's just fine. And, and the simple answer is, is that when, um, as long as you're, which we'll talk about, actually, I wanted to spend a bit of time on, on um, etiquette and operation. Uh, if you just go out there and your sole purpose is to get one of these radios and to program it and listen a lot, load up your weather app or your weather stations, um, frequencies for the, for the police, your local repeaters, and you listen a lot and you talk a little, you're, you're fine. Um, what will often happen, particularly if you find a radio club, is that uh, they'll, they'll help you. They'll correct you. They'll make recommendations on things you should and shouldn't do. And it's true that the test and the training will cover a lot of these points. There's going to be certain nuances and things that you will forget, and you are going to get mic fright. You're going to you're going to get in front of this thing, and you're going to start talking. And the first couple of times you do it, for some people, for a long time, you, you're going to you're going to forget how to do what it is you do. And so that's why people are pretty friendly on ham radio because we've all been through it, to some some case. And we're generally pretty accepting and pretty open with explaining what it is you should and shouldn't do. So with that said, let's talk about operation. So you, you got out. Um, where's, my, where's my trusty bow thing? <coughs> Excuse me. So here's your, here's your two types of uh, the spectrum of radio. <laughs> really inexpensive very expensive so you you get out you get your technician and you and you want to start talking right the important thing to remember is that you should always listen listen more than you ever talk and it's just human nature in general that that we just listen more so um, you're gonna do this without really knowing it or not so you get it if you, you program some repeaters or, or maybe you go on uh, some of those well-published, if you go on Google and you say prepper ham radio frequencies or emergency ham radio frequencies, you might have some simplex frequencies in your area that are well-trafficked. You can hop on there and you can just listen. And by say hop there, it's like you go and program it in the radio or you, in, or you use uh, software to do it. Now you're sitting there and you're listening and uh, there's a conversation going on and it ends. And how do you know it ended? Well, they terminate the call. Usually what happens is one or two of them will say 773 to each other, and then they'll sign off with their call sign. Oftentimes, when you're on uh, VHF on a repeater or whatever, one person is ending because they're either going um, away from the radio because they're going into doing some shopping or they're they're just shutting out for the day or, or they're going to work or whatever. The other person's still there. So if, if you're interested in communicating the conversation or you've been listening for a while and you have questions or, or you just have your own question, then you can hop on, try and remember that last call signs, uh, that last operator's call sign, and call the operator. And you can say something like that operator's call sign, holding down the mic, and then your call sign, question regarding blank. Now, you don't have to use your call sign right in the beginning, but it's it's generally pretty good etiquette um, that you do. I often use my call sign in the beginning of any kind of conversation because what I found, particularly for repeater people, is that they're usually either next to their HF equipment or they're next to their computer or their whatever. And what they'll do is they'll they'll pull up their phone and they'll pull up your they'll pull up your call sign so they can know about you, what it is you do, et cetera, et cetera. So it's generally just kind of polite if you just give your call sign, make it easier, and then you can say, hey, my name is Josh. Or they'll probably just say, hey, Josh, how's it going? Because they've pulled up your uh, your call sign. And then you can continue and ask your question. I think I mentioned this last time. Your goal is to uh, use your call sign in English every 10 minutes. And that's primarily the big thing. You don't want to talk on this in any manner that you wouldn't talk to your mother or grandma. Now... Some of us have more lewd grandmothers and mothers, but ideally you want to avoid profanity, politics, anything grotesque of a sexual nature, etc. Now, the reality is, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, the reality is, is there's often a lot of that <laughs> in pockets of ham radio. There are well-known pirate repeaters. Um, pirate's kind of the wrong term. They technically are operating correctly, 
but the people who use the repeater do not follow the, the letter of the FCC law. And because the FCC doesn't actually come down and start spanking people, there's not much you can do, right? Because that's kind of where we're at with ham radio. Um, the second thing, and, and I'll mention this because you'll get a lot... You will get a lot of crap from people if you don't if you don't follow this simple thing. Um, no kerchunking. Kerchunking. What's kerchunking? It's where you. I'm testing my radio, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna click this button a couple of times. And what repeaters often do is when you when you click the button and you let it go after you're done if you're done transmitting, the repeater will uh, give a tone carrier tone saying, "Okay, that person's disconnected." People will chunk the radio to not have to say their call sign or not have to say radio check, not have to say whatever. So don't chunk the radio. Give your call sign. Uh, do the right thing and say, hey, just radio check. Just checking to see my radio. KS6NAZ. That's your call sign. And then you're done. And then oftentimes you'll get uh, somebody who's monitoring the repeater come back. Say, hey, you're fine. You're coming in okay. Good to go. Uh, these are all very nominal things that are pretty easy to, to remember. And again, you're going to find that some things are more important than other things. And it's going to be dependent on your areas and what repeaters you talk on. And that, that buzz ball. Okay, so I covered, um, let's see, covered the electric component, the electrical components. I would like to say this. Let me go back. I'm going to go back really quick. This is just going to make... Oh, that's that's for future talks. I'm trying to scroll the screen that I'm on. I am an idiot. Let's go... Where is it? Okay. Uh, so generally, generally speaking, generally speaking, and this is going to help your... Uh, schematics reading career. I am not an elect an, a double E, an electronic engineer. I'm a software engineer. I'm a software engineer that likes to tinker with stuff. And I got bit by a bug some time ago to start playing around around with electronics. And um, I I learned when I started trying to read schematics that it's really important to understand where the positive and the and the return flow or the negative flow of circuit is. The top line is generally the positive side, and the bottom line is generally the negative side. And if you know that, it, it makes um, it makes powering your components easier. Because if you're using a breadboard like this, a project board, then you can use this top part as positive and this bottom part as negative. Um, or in the case of the way a lot of these work is these top two lines. I know it, it should be like this, but. Um, there's a positive line and a negative line. So once you know that, it's a lot easier to read, and you can generally tell where your load's coming from because where ground is. And so where's ground? Ground is here, and the little pitchfork things on the bottom. That's how that works. Got anybody in the chat? Where is everybody on my chat? Got a good amount of people in here listening, but nobody's chatting. Or am I just not getting it? I'm using my fancy, uh, using my fancy little uh, screen here to do it. All right, <clears throat> so let's, let me do a practice test. Practice test, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up with uh, something that, um, oh, something that I've been playing around with. So... Really quick, let me let me walk through this. I'm using I'm using the uh, AWRL app for for testing for showing the testing, and um, it breaks it up. If you go to re review question pool, it breaks it up by what section you're in, right? So FCC rules is T1, T2 is operating procedures, T3 is radio wave characteristic properties, and notice that there's just there's just a couple of questions in each one. T4, amateur radio, practice station, and setup. Oh, I'm sorry. There's multiple questions in each one. That's right. Yeah, then you have further breakdowns. 
sorry, never mind. But it, it shows you the breakdown in case you were curious. Um, that makes it a lot easier to know. So who was it? Hey, you was getting. So notice how T1A T through T1F is um, all FCC regulation related. That's a lot of questions. That's a lot of questions. So keep that in mind. Let's do new test. We're going to randomize. We want immediate feedback, and we do not want to auto advance. What is the most uh, common repeater frequency offset in the two meter band? I thought it was 500, but maybe that is um, 70 centimeter. Offset is considered, it's either positive or negative, and for chirp, which I've made many videos on, you can just say positive or negative, and it will use this standard, which is should be 600. It is 600. Um, so you don't really say, I want positive 600 uh, in the receive frequency for the talking frequency. You just say, I want positive or negative, and it assumes you mean 600. And if you want, you can set it to something different. D. With regard to satellite communication, what is Doppler shift? Oh man, I talked about this last night on uh, on the live chat on GunChannels.com. They had a, I guess, never enough ammo. Friend of mine here on the YouTube's. He had a live stream with two flat earthers, people who believe in the flat Earth. And I was uh, I was saying last night in the live stream, I wasn't able to attend his live stream, nor was I invited. And uh, from now on. If anybody does a live stream with any flat earthers, I want you to call me specifically to join so that I can uh, so I can give them the, read them the riot act. Uh, anyway, Doppler shift is the change in distance from distance of sound waves, any kind of waves, right? And that includes RF. You ever hear the you know the alarm from a, or a, the siren of a car? That's the Doppler shift. The sound, the time it takes to get to you from when the sound was created. Doppler shift. So what is it? A special digital communications mode for satellites. No. An observed change in signal frequency caused by relative motion between the satellite and the Earth station. That sounds really good. A change in the satellite orbit? No. A mode where satellite receives signals on one band and transmits on another. While D is the uh, is a thing satellites do, that is not the case. It is... B. I think that I have a pretty good argument against the flat Earth just using the characteristics of the round satellite orbit and Doppler shift, which you have to account for. I, um, this radio is set up to work SO50 satellite, and I have the Doppler programmed into it. Okay, what is the term used to describe the sub-audible tone transmitted with normal voice audio to open the squelch of the receiver. Uh, that would be the CTCSS. That is the sub-audible tone, often referred to as PL tone. So uh, you'll go to your repeater reference. I don't have a physical PL. I do. I'm not going to get it. <laughs> I do have a repeater uh, reference book. But if you go online to radioreference.com, like I mentioned in some of my videos, there is a PL tone that you're going to see. That PL tone is what opens up the squelch on the repeater. And it's sent when you start to hold down the... Um, oh, that's another good operating uh, procedure thing. Hold down the button, maybe give it a second, then start talking. Because sometimes the PL tone can uh, take a while to open up. George Romo, I'm a new kind of guy, shy, had a bad experience from old timers that has no patience for newcomers. You prepper, you guys just want to get your tech license and disappear. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest. Um, I, I know that that's a thing. I know that that's a thing that there's people who just want to get their technicians, technician license and then they just want to disappear. The reality is, is that um, I think HF and understanding the digital modes and a lot of the stuff related to, to proper radio and understanding radio is going to be much more valuable than um, operating on a Baofeng. A lot of preppers love Baofengs, man. 
I bought five Balfangs just ready for the apocalypse. That's great, but I bet you can't uh, do packet radio and send um, emails between sites. Probably not. I bet you can't use, uh, you can't, can you see it behind me? Oh yeah, you can. Look at this, look at this little box right there, that little gray box. That's my QRP radio. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but I've been playing around with something called Whisper. It's a digital mode. Um, I have been received all over this country with that, with that 10 watt radio using uh, an antenna that's now on my roof that I put up this weekend. No problem. You can get received by them using my computer to send out digital tones. Digital tones, man. Something that are super, super awesome for preppers. Everybody's concerned. Well, I don't want people to understand my communications when I'm talking on the phone. So I'm going to use a coded blah, blah, blah. You could do that. Why not use digital? They can't, unless they know what mode of digital you're on and they've got the right ear to do it and they've got the right radio guy available. But if radio guys are less than 10% of the community, then having digital modes, and, and yeah, you can actually run digital modes through um, your Baofeng. See, that's what the important thing to understand. You can do digital on, on FM. Um, you just have to have somebody listening to the frequency to receive it. That's actually a good video. I should, I should do a video on that. Um, I've got my iPad. In fact, what the hell? We'll show you right now. This iPad I've got set up with these different, uh, this different software. I can use my Baofeng and another iPad and my Baofeng and my iPad and we can send, uh, no, that's, that's Hamlog, that's not going to do it. We can send uh, PSK31 to each other. PSK31, that's the waterfall walking down the middle. I can say, hi, Josh, we need more ammo. And then I can transmit that via digital. So what would it sound like if you just were listening on the frequency? <laughs> You could do it though, right? Right now, what you're seeing this uh, the 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 iPad is is receiving via the microphone, and it's trying to convert my voice into text. That's what this all this crap is that you see there. Okay, George Romo, thank you so much. You have to start somewhere. I uh, yeah. So hey, the the I'm I'm sorry first of all that that you dealt with with old timers i hope it wasn't in a club if it was anything it was probably a repeater um i i often am surprised how often i hear that from people that they had a bad experience i guess i was just lucky i don't know i don't know what it is sorry uh hey eric jones eric jones wants to derail the entire class right now to ask a very specific question. That's okay. Um, I started out in C++ and then went to Java quickly, unbeknownst to me, just a fresh graduate out of college. And they said, do you know Java? And I said, no. And they said, well, you better learn it because here's your first project. It was in Java. And then I ended up going into um, real time in C, embedded C, and other stuff for um, all kinds of things I can't talk about. Now I am a software integration and test manager for a fairly large uh, program. So there you go. That's the answer to that question. So back on, to back on topic. And I don't mind answering questions like that. So have you played with indoor HF antennas, something that works in an apartment? Yeah, Beautiful Home Contracting Limited. I, um, I have not. The reason I have not is because I own a home. I put up a 65-foot dipole over the week. So, no. Um, with that said, you can do an attic dipole if you live in an HOA. Uh, there are people who do balcony antennas. Verticals are sometimes good for balcony antennas. Using the actual metal railing as a ground plane, not the best, but um, any antenna is better than no antenna, which is sometimes what people say. And then what else? There are uh, loop antennas. Loop antennas give you a lot of cool capability. The bigger the loop, the more effective they are. Uh, there are they can be noisy. 
and so you have to be pretty good at, at tuning them. Some are automatic, those are the very expensive ones, but, but a lot of them are manual and you can just get in there and kind of tweak them a little bit and make them work. Uh, pound for pound, they say loop antennas are some of the best, bet, best bang for your buck, particularly in space limited areas. Your mileage will vary. Uh, George Roma, I was gifted with a Collins complete radio that was salvaged from a PT boat from a family member, and I'd like to get it working and do it legally. Holy crap, man. I have no idea the kind of poor condition that thing could be in. Uh, it's going to be a vacuum tube radio. It's, it's going to be difficult. Oh, um, no. Hmm. Let me go back. So let me go back to George in a second. Aaron Ray, I'm not implying that you're sending secret message uh, via digital. I'm implying that for preppers who say, I don't want to use ham radio because it's just in the clear in the open, and they say that they are going to use coding, you know, the swallow flies at midnight, I say digital is a nice way to not do that, to avoid not doing that, as it is an actual thing. Understand that most people don't understand what digital is, particularly on FM, and a lot of people don't understand how to use it. So no, I, I did not mean you're, you're secretly transmitting. And there he goes, part 97 section. There's always one of those guys in every chat. Uh, 97.113, prohibited transmissions. No amateur station shall transmit messages encoded for the purpose of securing their meaning, except as otherwise provided herein. I believe the, uh, the only is... Uh, remote RF for planes or whatever. Or is that just you don't have to send your uh, call sign? Anyway, not important. I'm not implying people go and be all secretive with their with their thing. I'm saying if you are a prepper and you know <laughs> that you want to do something that people generally don't go into that area, digital is a way to go. Again, make sure you're not on a frequency that is uh, being used. Um, 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 uh. Oh, George Romo, getting back to it. PT boat, perfect condition, was refurbished, also have lots of original call. Wow, okay, so more power to you. That's awesome. The only downside is that's going to be AM. I'm, I'm guessing that's AM. Not a lot of people do AM, and I, I have not ventured into this world, but there probably lie, therein lies something that you can modify it maybe to do c single sideband. So, uh, Skyhauser, yeah, technically it is a, it's a secret to those who can't decode it, but it's not purposely coded so that no one can decode it. Anyone could decode it if they just knew what it was, the digital mode. Okay, let's see if we can get through these pretty quickly here. Which of the following dis uh, divides, oh, devices, provides, oh, you know what? I just realized, well, that buzz ball really got to my head. And then I, I forgot that I've got my Young's Double Chocolate Stout sitting here. So, yeah, I do have a pretty good beer. Now, um, if you're at all interested in beer, Young's Double Chocolate Stout. Oh, there's the camera. Young's Double Chocolate Stout can actually be mixed one-to-one -one with um, banana bread beer made by another company. They're all the same company, I'm pretty sure, or affiliated really good it makes banana double chocolate banana bread beer awesome mm. all right i'll put some mellow on that buzz ball high which of the following devices provides data to the transmitter when sending automatic position reports from a mobile amateur radio station a wwv receiver a global positioning system gps you could probably just stop there and say it's GPS, right? Oop, it's GPS. Sometimes it's best to just remember the right answer and not mess with the other ones. What causes tropospheric ducting? A discharge of light, uh, lightning during electrical storms, sunspots and solar flares, updrafts from hurricanes and tornadoes, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. So. Um, one of the important things to remember with ham radio, yeah, be, again, we're going back to the digital thing, beautiful home contracting. Anyone with digital software could figure things out. There are no secrets there. Yeah, yes, yes, I agree. I'm saying, 
Let me go back to what I was saying. On 2 meter and 70 centimeter, not a lot of people rock in digital. And if you and me just wanted to do something on a, on a path less traveled, if we just hopped onto one of the frequencies and started talking and somebody eavesdropped on our conversation, they'd understand it. If we pulled out our iPads and just sent a, um, a digital message to each other, possibly less likely to be, to be uh, intercepted, etc. Still could be recorded, and you could play back the recording and decode it using an iPad or using a software engine. You get the idea. Guys, guys, everybody calm down. Calm down. Have a have a Young's double chocolate stout. Okay. Uh, so, what was I going to say? All radio, I believe the answer here is B, by the way. Or, oh, is it hey? Hmm. Where's Pastor? I need Pastor from last week. Uh, I thought it was uh, B, sunspots and solar flares. But... Troposcoptic ducting, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. Could very well be D, too. To be honest, I don't really know. But uh, Hey You says D. He's much more studied up than I am because he's getting 80 for, uh, 87%. He was right. So remember that. Which term describes the rate at which electrical energy is used? Used. Which term describes the rate at which energy is used? I believe that's D current. No! No, oh, it's power. <laughs> Don't listen to me, guys. I'm only the one running this class. Uh, let me go back. So commit that to memory. Don't listen to Josh. Uh, which term describes the rate at which electrical energy is used? So I was uh, thinking to myself, the current implies how much is being consumed, which would be D, but no, it's A, power. Of course. Where should the negative return connection of a mobile transceiver's power cable be connected? Uh, at the battery or engine block ground strap, at the, anten ooh, at the antenna mount, to any metal part of the vehicle through the transceiver's mounting bracket. So mobile implies in an automobile. Um, those are your more powerful than a handy talkie, but less powerful than a ground station. So um, you want to at least have a good ground To any metal, metal part of the vehicle is bad because it could just be a free-floating metal part that's really not connected to the frame. Because don't you want it to be connected to the frame, which is the lar like the largest piece of the car? The battery is the best place. Um, and then an engine blow. I've never seen... Yeah, I'm going to go with battery. Yeah. So there is a negative terminal on a battery. Um, it's best if you go to that and there i've never used a grounding strap on a car engine block you can but keep that in mind yeah to any so i've done this in multiple car installations of cb radios and ham radios and just other radios there are things that are metal that are not very good grounds um also things that are metal are often painted or coated in something so you got to make sure you scrub that off whatever which of the following devices is most useful for VHF weak signal communication? <laughs> a omnidirectional antenna, a mobile VHF FM transceiver, a quarter wave vertical antenna, a multi-mode VHF transceiver. Which of the following devices is most useful for VHF signal communication? Hmm. Oh, I was reading a question from Hey You. I heard jumping a car, you can kill the alternator by hooking up straight to the battery or something funny like that. Well, I mean, you jump the car through the battery, so, right? 
So, um, this question, <laughs> which of the following devices is most useful for VHF, very high frequency, weak signal communications? An omnidirectional antenna, which is kind of another way of saying vertical, or it could be a dipole, um, which is almost omnidirectional. A mobile VHF FM transceiver, a multi-mode VHF transceiver. Hmm. So, I could see working any of those. <laughs> um, who, first one in, Tilapia says B, a mobile VHF FM transceiver, which is, again, something you get in a car. A uh, quarter wave vertical antenna is going to be more lossy than a half wave antenna. Um like a half-wave dipole in HF, that's what I use for QRP. Very good. An omnidirectional antenna, that's also some kind of loss involved. And then you get a mobile VHF FM, which is one mode. Mode is FM, implies FM. And then multi-mode VHF transceiver, implying single sideband, FM, digital. Uh, I don't see any one of those that leads to weak signal communication. Because VHF is, is pretty high bandwidth, as we already mentioned. I don't like any of these answers. This is a pretty bad question, actually. I kind of want to write this down and make a note of it. Because <laughs> I want to go off and, and read about it. Where's my... Uh... So this comes out of T7A09. T7... A09 uh, regarding weak signal. And the the chat is as split B C B A D. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay. D. I'm going to go D. Yes. Okay. Let me explain why. So we just talked about bandwidth. FM requires a lot of bandwidth. Multimode implies that it could do CW or SSB. Those are both preferred in weak signal communication. So that's a really good question now that I think about it. Okay. I'm glad we worked that out. I don't remember seeing that when I took my uh, technician class license over 10 years ago. So, Okay. What is meant by voice over internet protocol as as used in amateur radio? A method of delivering voice communications over the internet using digital frequencies? A set of guidelines for working DX during contest? Nope. A technique for measuring the modulation quality of a transmitter? Nope. A set of rules specifying uh, it's A. Okay. VoIP. VoIP, right? Voice over internet protocol. Yeah, that last one was good to remember. Uh, I'm glad we worked through it. Multi-mode is good for weak signal because it implies you can do CW or single sideband. Bueno. For which license classes are new licensees currently available from the FCC? For which licenses are new licensees currently available? Uh, they can have any. So it's A. You can go in as a newbie, and you can get a technician, a general, and an amateur extra all in one sitting. No reason to come back. Uh, most people do, and don't feel bad if you do. I did. But that was because at the time I didn't realize how cool HF was. Otherwise, I probably would have sat for my general. Are amateur station control operators ever permitted to operate outside the frequency privilege of their license class? Um, so you have three answers here um, that are all no. I'm sorry, <laughs> there are three answers that are all yes, and then one no. And the qualifier, voice over IP, isn't that talking on your cell phone at the urinal? Very good. Uh, yeah, so you, there's a trump card answer for all these questions. If anything comes up and says, 
the immediate safety of human life or protection of property, then that's the answer. So safety trumps all in ham radio. Safety and, and seriously saving some expensive equipment trumps all. If you're sitting in front of a, 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 a Collins PT boat AM only radio that only talks on the AF frequencies that you don't have access to as a technician class, pick up the microphone and talk on it if you can get help, right? There's no reason that you, you can, no, 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 I'm only a technician class. If it's to immediately save life or protect property, you can. Remember that one. Uh-oh. How many milliamps is in 1.5 amps? Amps. So these ones I always get messed up on. This is pure memorization. And if you don't use it a lot, sadly, you you lose it. Um, so I'm going to take this out of my ear. It's either A or B. I'm pretty sure it's either A or B. I'm just going to shoot uh, in the dark and say B. Nope, it was A. Okay, there you go. Again, don't do what I do. Go take these multiple times, and then you'll you'll remember. What should members of a tower work team wear? A hard hat and see. Safe... Wait, when? Oh, when? Uh, I like that. At all times, except when climbing the tower. Uh, only when the tower exceeds thirty feet in height. At all times, except when, except, it, it, okay, safety, right? Safety. It says safety. You don't really have an exception to safety. You just always choose the answer that involves the safest thing. And the answer is D. There's no except. If something says but or except, it's not the right answer. It's D. Which of the following controls could be used if the voice pitch of a single sideband signal seems too high or low? Uh, the receiver writ or clarifier, the AGC or limiter, the bandwidth selection, or the tone squelch? This question is derpy. <laughs> yeah, it's deep, by the way. Mm. The last question, derpy. Okay, it is A. A. There you go. A receiver RIT, R I T, or clarifier. These are component E questions, parts of the radio. Gordon West's book goes into greater detail. And um, actually, it doesn't go into enough detail. This is part of uh, some of the things in the book that I would say you could go a step beyond and just wiki what these are, Google them and you'll get a better answer. Particularly if you want to know. Like, if you want to know, again, this does not do single sideband. Repeater talkies, we don't use a single sideband. We don't get on single sideband. You need a radio for single sideband. You'd be using... There, there's not even really any access for a technician for single sideband. So the question's kind of weird, unless you're talking single sideband on 2 meters and 70 centimeters, which not a lot of people do. People do, I know they do, but hey, just keep that in mind. Which of these components can be used as an electronic switch or amplifier? Uh, an electronic switch, an oscillator, a potentiometer, a voltmeter, or a transistor. So a switch or amplifier, switch implies that there's multiple paths. Every one of those but D has two paths into them, D. And I already mentioned that transistors are also used as amplifiers. That's why we went away from vacuum tubes. Oh, is it is it too small? Sorry about that. Um, I guess I never really, I just make these videos. <laughs> I never look at the outcome of it. I can rejigger things so we can see it better. Sorry about that. What are the frequency limits of the UHF spectrum? Uh, oh, man. UHF. 70 centimeters. You're going to have to just 
put this in uh, memorization because I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. It is... Sometimes you can work this out on your own. This this time I don't think that I can. <laughs> I've had too much of my uh, party ball. And an effort in the uh, in an effort to save time, I'm just going to move it along. What? Oh, we're getting answers. 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. That's not even an option. <laughs> That's not even an option, man. Let's go with D. Yay! Who gets the points? Hey, you. Hey, you. You got the points for that one. Congratulations. So, again, you're going to... Um, so, this this is... Uh, these are very important questions. But, <laughs> but, some of the stuff you're going to forget about. Um, you're going to study it now. And they're going to be like me 10 years down the line. And you're going to be like, I forgot. What is this? That's why you have Google. And that's why you have test equipment. I've got my antenna analyzer over here. And you've got your actual radios in front of you that you can figure this stuff out. So don't kill yourself to remember everything. But at the same time, there it is. It's D. What fact? Again, but, but do learn it so you pass your test. At least remember it. And then... Safety's first, and then all this other stuff is... Actually, safety first, then uh, proper operations so you don't piss people off, and then everything else. What factors affect the RF exposure of people near an antenna station antenna? Frequency and power level of the RF field, distance from the antenna to the person, radiation pattern of the antenna. All of those are correct. I will jump out and scream from the hilltops that uh, it is A, all of these are correct, and... Um, this is one of the few cases where the A or the all of the above is the right answer. I've shown multiple instances where they try and trick you and they uh, will put all of the above and it's not all of the above. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let me explain. The frequency and power level is, is kind of obvious. If somebody's putting out like some serious power, you can hurt yourself. RF burn is a real thing. In fact, I RF burned myself when I was doing that soda video when I went on the top of Smith Mountain. I had my antenna must have touched something, and I got a it it jolted me, and I was using my Bio No um, battery pack, my LifePo, really nice battery can put out some some decent um, life polymer um, power, and it it did directly into my thumb. So distance from the antenna, obviously, the more power you're putting, the closer you are. Even if it's QRP minus QRP, you still I was right there close to it, and I got zapped. Zap is the wrong term. It's it's a burn. It's heat, right? It's heat, and then it's uh, it's not like an arcing of electricity, and then radiation pattern of the antenna. So some antennas are directional, and if you get within that beam, you could get hit with more of that that RF. Okay, next question: Which of the following bands above thirty megahertz that are available to technician class operators? Have mode restricted subbands. Mode restricted subbands. Which of the bands above 30 megahertz are available to the technician class op? Wait, wait, wait. That are available to technician class operators have mode restricted subbands. Well, two meters is on all of this, which I didn't think was the case. Um. I want to go C. Is you should be able to do all of them, but 1.2. No, it's 1.2. Yeah, six meters, two meters, and 1.25. Uh, there's a couple ones that jump out at you. The the 1.25 being the one that jumped out immediately to me. I know six and two, I guess do, but I was kind of like meh, because pretty much do, they do everything. But no, so it is A, 6 meter, 2 meter, and 1.25 meter. Commit that to memory. Why should the outer jacket of the coaxial cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? Uh, ultraviolet and RF signals can mix together, causing interference. Ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water to enter the cable. 
Ultraviolet light can increase the losses of the cable's jacket. Ultraviolet resistance, resistant jackets, per, wait, wait. Uh, ultraviolet resistant jackets prevent harmonic radiation. That's not why you want an ultraviolet resistant jacket. Ultraviolet and RF signals can mix together, causing interference. So what is an RF jacket? So what is a coax doing? The center post of the coax is where your, your driven end is, and the shielding is where it comes back, da it comes back down. Um, ultraviolet light doesn't do anything to RF. So the only thing it would do is break it down and allow water in. You don't want water in your or your your um, coax because it turns it into a um, dummy load. It stops resonating. Hopefully that makes sense. What best describes a relay? A current controlled amplifier, a switch controlled by an electromagnet, an optical sensor, or a pass transistor. So it's B, a switch controlled by an electromagnet, a relay. What is a relay? Think about it. It's a something that you can pop the relay signal by putting voltage through it. Let the magnet go. Electromagnet. Pop. That's right. Which of the following is an example of automatic control? Using a computer or other device to automatically send CW. Controlling the station over the internet or <laughs> over the internet over the internet. Using a computer or other device to automatically identify repeater operation I don't know automatic um, C using a computer or other device to automatically identify no D okay repeater operation it was gonna be one of those so there you go repeater operation which I guess um, you're not there and someone keying it with their CTCC or CCTC code. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. There you go. D, repeater operation. What type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF and UHF voice repeaters? We've already talked about it. It is FM. AM, most people don't use. PSK is digital mode. That's phase shift keying, mostly digital. And then single sideband is used by HF, um, less so 2 meter and 70 centimeter, but they're doing that for simplex calls, one to one. FM. Which of the following might damage a multimeter? Uh, basically, I don't even have to look at these. Hooking it up to anything that puts off more voltage than it says it can handle. Measuring a voltage too small? No. Attempting to measure voltage when using the resistance, leaving the meter in the millionth position overnight not allowing it to warm up properly, measuring a voltage too small for the... Really? We're okay. Um, attempting to measure voltage when, use, when using the resistance setting. Eh. Leaving the meter in the milliamps position overnight, measuring a voltage too small for the chosen scale. Too small? I wouldn't think it's too small. Not allowing it to warm... I mean, multimeters are... C sounds like the only one that's possible. Yeah, C. I, I mean, A implies vacuum tubes <laughs> warming up. That's crazy. Um, voltage, you, yeah, that makes sense. Now, understand, too, that... Um, yeah, no, that, that's the answer. Just remember that. <laughs> we, don't have to, we don't have to pontificate. What is the approximate length in inches of a quarter wavelength vertical for 146 megahertz? So quarter of, wait, what is the appro approximate length in inches? So you have to convert the megahertz to inches. And I don't remember what the algorithm is for that. One hundred forty six is um, two meter. Two meter is seven. 
six inches, so a quarter of that. Why is it 234? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> quarter wavelength in feet equals 230. Yeah, 234 divided by frequency in megahertz omnidirectional. So um, you can use your scratch paper if you'd like to do this. You can have um, so the cheapy 300 divided by 146 equals. That's not right. Two, three, four, divided by one forty-six equals one point six. Am I doing that wrong? It's twelve. <laughs> no, it's nineteen. It's nineteen. I hate you guys. I hate you guys. I'm gonna. I'm gonna fail my test. Anyway, use your scratch paper. Um. So that's not right, though. So if you do two, three, four, divided by 146 146 divided by 234 yeah none of this is right no, that's not right <laughs> that's not right oh that was in feet so then you take oh my god ay 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 234 divided by 146 this is really riveting and then you div no you multiply that by 12 19 ha ha okay Commit this to memory. 234 divided by the frequency. That's your distance in feet. And then whatever. If you want inches, divide by whatever. Okay. There you go. So the answer is B, 19. Which of the following battery types is rechargeable? Uh, so all, because I've got B and C, and I know they're rechargeable. Sure, nic nickel metal hydride. Why not? NICAD. Right, I can. What is connected to the green wire in a three-wire electrical AC plug? The neutral, right? No, the safety ground. Safety ground. It's like the safety dance. Uh, safety first. It said safety. There you go. Yeah, one forty-six is the two-meter van. I knew that. I knew that. That was not the problem. Uh, under which of the following circumstances are amateur sta stations? authorized to transmit signals related to broadcasting, program production, a news gathering, assuming no other means available. So, uh, this is such a cool answer. It's always spacey, blah, blah, blah. It's space shuttle. Space shuttle. You can only rebroadcast or transmit um, when there's unrelated space shuttle business going on but the space shuttle i guess they should make that say the satellite oh no it's d because there's no shuttle yeah so there's no shuttle <laughs> but there there is one that has to do with music being as long as it's an incidental nature having to do with the space station but as always, D trumps all safety of human life or protection of property. D. Which of the following results from the fact that skip signals reflected from the ionosphere are elliptically polarized? Which of the following results? Digital modes are un unusable. Either vertically or horizontally polarized antennas may be used for the transmission or reception. Both the transmitting and the receiving antennas must be in the same polarization. FM voice is unusable. Which of the following results from the fact skip signals? Skip signals are skipping across the ionosphere. Reflected from the ionosphere in elliptically. An ellipses is a circle. So the point they're trying to make is that you can... I think it's B. Yeah. So elliptical implies that you can receive no matter what your plane of your antenna is. When using tactical identifiers such as race headquarters during a community service net operation, how often must your station transmit every 10 minutes? Just every 10 minutes. Always. Doesn't matter. No special rules. No special 
uh, not me, no any of that. Um, just always at the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during communication. That's it. What should you do if something in your neighbor's home is causing harmful interference to your amateur station? Tell your neighbor to get bent. I'm reading comments. Aaron Ray is typing an uh, answer. Uh, tell them to get bent. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, check your station to make sure it meets standards, good amateur practice. Politely inform your neighbor about the rules that prohibit the use of devices which cause interference. Um, all of these choices are correct. Work with your neighbor to identify the offending device. Uh, all of those are good. There it is. Uh, Aaron Ray posted the uh, incidental. Yeah, it, it's all the above. Remember, no excuse to always put all of the above. Which of the following services are prohibited from interference by amateur signals under all circumstances? Which of the following services are protected? Oh, sorry. Protected from interference by amateur signals under all circumstances? Which of the following services are protected from interference? Meaning, um, amateurs talking over the top of broadcast service, radio navigation service, land, mobile. I'm going to go with radio navigation, um, implying that there's people who could get totally lost and die. Let's see. Yeah. All those other ones can take a share the, share the waves. But that's the only one where they cannot backseat. What is the current flowing? Wait, what is the current flowing through a 100 ohm resistor connected across 200 volts? That's the one where you divide. Um, two. Yes, two amps. So you take 200 volts divided by 100 ohms. Boom, two. Stop it. Why is coaxial cable used more uh, more often than any other feed line for amateur radio systems? It has less loss than any other type of feed. It is easy to use and requires few special installation considerations. It can handle more power than any other type of feed line. It is less expensive than any other types of feed line. I think it's B. It's easy to use and requires few special installation considerations. Yeah. So it's not uh, less lossy. Ladder line is, is much less lossy, is implying that you're um, free from things that can cause interference, which is why coax is used, because the way that the shielding wraps around the center post, um, they cancel each other out, and they're relatively protected from interference. Uh-oh. Uh, component 2. What is component 2 in figure T1? We talked about this. It's three legs. What component has three legs? I will drink beer until you tell me. Ah, that's good beer. Ah. Come on, you guys got this. We've already been talking about them. Yes. I'm going to go with the first one. It's B. Ice bomb. Good work. What is the basic unit of capacitance? Farad, right? Farad? Farad. Yes. Farad. Put that to memory. Am I done? I passed. 31 out of 35. Uh, what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening, and no legs at night? What is man? Man is the answer to that riddle. Okay, so that's it. Um, lastly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this before we wrap up. Feel free to ask questions at this point. Where is it? There it is. 
So um, this was me playing around with Whisper for about 10 minutes um, last night. This is just the capture I did at 10 minutes. I've been running this for hours and hours and hours the last three nights with my new antenna. Uh, Billy Sanders. Yes. Oh, yeah, man. Look at that. Billy Sanders inspiring me to go for my tech license and two months later getting my general. That's awesome. Then you will love to hear what I have to say about this little map. So me in the lower left outside of Los Angeles uh, is my, my station running at 10 watts. Most base stations are running at 100 watts. At 10 watts, I was able to use Whisper, which is a very low power transmission. Um, and I was able to, to hit all those stations. And by hit, they received my beacon. I, it's a beaconing um, system. I don't have to sit there. So what I can do with it is basically um, check what my propagation is like. And case in point, you know what? Let me switch to the web. Can I go over to the web here? Yeah. Let me just bring up the website. Show you exactly what it is. Just go to Whisper, WSPR. Um, so, I, I would love to do, uh, there is me, I want, let's do the last 24 hours, get ready for this. So here's the map of everybody who heard me on 10 watts. So uh, yesterday I had down in Panama, can't see it, I had been down in Panama. Yesterday, we were all the way up to Alberta, here in Utah, all my prepper people in Utah. Um, yeah, so got a question. What would, it, uh, what would it do to convince me to do a general crash course? So the problem is that what I'm doing right now, although I am, I am doing practice tests and I, and I am covering some of the details, I'm more or less empowering you to do a lot of the work. If you were to go to a ham radio crash course, you would sit down, you would look at slides with questions, and you would impale yourself with that information. We're not doing that largely because I want you to go by Gordon West's book, and I don't want to um, I don't want to infringe on his copyright of the good work he did. So I'm not doing anything verbatim. Nor am I going to produce slides um, on teaching this content to you because there's already better options for it. So for me to do general, um, I would. It's, it's really tough because general relies on a lot of remembering things, a lot of math, um, more circuitry, more science. And that would require leveraging content that someone else made. And because I'm not going to do that, I don't want to leverage somebody else's copyright or their content. It's hard for me to go much further than technician because this is, you know, you know what I mean? Um, hope that makes sense. Hello, I follow you from Milan, Italy. Could you give me a link where I can download the Mac program to install Baofeng UV5R radio? Thank you. So if you go, if you just search Ham Radio Crash Course on the on the Google you know, YouTube's here, uh, my radio videos will come up. Any of the ones that mention Baofeng will um, will include a link to Chirp. Chirp is spelled C H I R P. That is what you want. It will work for Mac. Um, now, this always leads to the follow-on question. I tried it. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? It doesn't work because you most likely bought the cheap programming cable. The cheap programming cables are all counterfeit. Um, on Macs, we don't have the ability to run the counterfeit driver that comes with the cable that's for Windows use. So my recommendation is always buy the legit cable always always buy the legit cable right okay did i i think that's gonna oh wait yeah so i hit i, I hit whisper yeah so basically using my small low powered station i'm able to talk to like not talk to but i'm able to be heard by all these people across the country so that's pretty impressive 
Um, I'm going to get a much bigger radio, hopefully sooner rather than later, so that's going to be awesome. If you want good tools with practice exams, try it. will give you large tools that will help you exceed what you need in USA. I don't know what you said there. Um, Echo Link. Only one Echo Link in Oklahoma City area, and my only radio currently is the Baofeng. You can't touch it from my location. Always looking for things to try with a for what. Hmm. Uh oh. Wife's calling me, so I think we're going to wrap it up there. Go ahead and put that on. Should have put that on mute. Now everything's blowing up. <laughs> anyway, want to take a, a quick second to say, to thank you, P. Cola Smith. That was very generous of you. I super appreciate that. I will buy beer for the next time we do this. Uh, lastly, Mac Daddy eighty nine thirteen with the last question of the day. How did you get into ham? Um, I was I was uh, approached by someone on um, the first company I got hired onto outside of college. And he was a ham. Started talking to me about ham radio. Um, I was on a program in the radio world, and I it just kind of like went hand in hand. Made made perfect sense. Uh, fell in love with it. Fell in love with VHF UHF. Got bit with the HF bug about four years ago. Um, started. Training for my general, got my general, started studying uh, CW, got derailed from CW when I had Edison, and and here we are. I'm, I'm active in, in digital modes most of all, mainly because I use such uh, small powered radios. I will be buying most likely an ICOM 7300 sometime in 2018. That will become my, my base station radio. And, uh, and then I'm going to get back into CW. I really want to learn CW better because with CW, I can, I can get to really small radios with, with tiny antennas. Not tiny, but, you know, small, easy, packable antennas and, and have a blast with that. Talk all over the place. So, anyway, that'll do it, guys. If, um, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Go check out the Ham Radio Crash Course videos um, if you haven't already. If you have a Baofeng and you want to know how to set it up. I've made a ton of videos. I'd be you'd be surprised how many times I get qu I get a question from someone saying, "Hey, I watched this video. Do you have this video?" Well, yeah, I do, and then I end up linking them to it. It's like just go search for whatever you want. My name will pop up. I, I will pop up. I promise. So that's it. We're gonna we're gonna cut it for today. Thank you again, everybody, and we'll try again to do this next week. And I'll keep it I'll keep it going. All right. Take it easy. And by the way, go buy the books and, and start using your. Start using those apps, man. Study and then register for a test and go take the test and then you can come back here and tell me how you got your license. All right, that's it. I can't stop the stream. Oh my God, we've got this going again. <laughs> this is happening again. So I have to refresh my page. I don't know why you, YouTube can't figure this stuff out. You click this button that says stream. It's supposed to turn off, it doesn't turn off. Nope, all right, well I'm gonna stop it this way and then I'll end it, end it later. Alright guys, see ya.